Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. I'm going to read out of my Bible, so my tablet. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that my, uh, my eyes will be able to see what's on the pages. So, praise God. I've been trusting the Lord for a lot of healings in a lot of ways. I got a little girl that lost some kind of a, I think it's some kind of a hair tie down or whatever. So, it's up here in my, my desk. Now, why am I doing that? Anyway, I've been meditating a lot about, I don't, I don't really have a message today. I just keep hearing the same old thought. And, and maybe, maybe uh, I can paraphrase um, primarily what I'm sensing in my spirit uh, right now. And uh, the main thing... Well, you're going to first, I got to take this off. Sometimes I wonder why I even wear it. So anyway, I, I, I spent a lot of time um, dealing with the aspect after our 30th um, anniversary party and thinking about Jesus you know, he, he, how Jesus, had, what he had to go through shortly after. The first thing he was, he was full of the Spirit, but it says the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And um, I've learned this a long time ago. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that after you're baptized, Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. I think 40 is a symbolical number. I, I don't believe it's just a number. I think it's a symbolical number, um, and I think for most of us, we get a choice. You come through the waters of baptism, you take his name, you take his nature, you take of who he is, he removes out of you the old man, okay, and you get a choice. From that point on, you get 40 days or 40 years, it's up to you. You can, you, can, you, can, you can either declare the word of the Lord and, and it doesn't mean you're going to go free. If Jesus had to be hungry, then it was the key thing. You're going to have to be hungry. <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to have to be hungry for the word. You're going to have to be hungry and you're not going to make the bread of life out of stones because as far as he's concerned, the stone was rolled away. Your stone was rolled away. My stone was rolled away. And so that was all done. But as I begin to take a look at it, we have in this day and age, and I've, I've read this scripture before this church probably a hundred times in 30 years. But I don't think we always get it. Because sometimes... We get the idea that Jesus did it all. Now got quiet. Nobody's saying anything. Y'all looking at me. What's he going to say next? God. I don't know if I can take this. I believe that what the Father gave him to do, he finished. What God gave him to do was the redemptive act the redemptive work, I believe God gave that to him to do, to destroy the works of the devil, that he did. That is a picture of the three men on a cross, two on either side of him. One was Adam who wouldn't repent, and the other was Adam who did repent. <clears throat> and when we begin to understand, he gave him that to do. But that wasn't all the Father had required him. That wasn't all that the Father wanted done. So I want to read this 
course of scripture, and I'm just going to, I'm going to jump through the first couple, three chapters of the book of Acts and just begin to point out some things that I feel is there. <clears throat> Verse 1 of the first chapter, the former Triester letter, um, have I made, O Theopolis. Now this is being written by John, and Theopolis means friend of God. Okay, could be a man, could be a group of people, but it could be those who are friends of God. The former trias have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Say, he began to do and teach. That was all written in the book of Luke. Okay? Both to do and teach until... Um, the day in which he was taken up. That didn't mean, that meant the day he was caught up. That was that day that was 40 days after, his, a, after he went through all that test, all, all that, that 40 day period where he walked in the spirit. He had already come in resurrection life. He appeared and disappeared. He met with them. He, didn't meet, he was there all the time. They just didn't behold him. The only time he went to heaven was he said to Martha at the gate, she thought he was the gardener. Remember, she thought he was the gardener. He was the gardener. He turned the graveyard into a garden. I, I, I'll get there. But anyway, he, he was the, she thought he was the gardener, and he said, touch me not, for I am not ascended to my God, my Father and your Father, my God and your God. I have not ascended. Why would he have to ascend? Because he had to ascend as the high priest and take his own blood to fill the covenant, the old covenant, to fulfill it and sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat in the heavenlies, in God's place. And then he appeared and he disappeared eight times. Eight times he appeared, he disappeared. He appeared and disappeared. The road to Emmaus, remember? First, first appearance was to her, then it was the road to Emmaus, and then the other appearances that he appeared and disappeared. He was walking in full resurrection life, okay? And then, after 40 days, he was caught up. There was above 500 people seeing him caught up. You're all getting quiet on me. But Paul wrote in Corinthians, he said, above 500 saw him go up. But when it came to the, them waiting 10 days to see the fulfillment of the promise of God in the day of Pentecost, 380 of them went home. They always found something more important to do. I wouldn't want God to have them give me a promise and then I think that I got something more important to do. I might miss out on my meeting with him. And so when we come to this reading here, we come to the realization that he gave them, now listen to what he said, of what Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. After that, say after he was taken up. He, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments on the apostles in whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen to them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What did he talk about? The kingdom of God. Now we've talked a lot around here about, about um, miracles and signs and wonders, and that's all they, they had. They had that all expressed it's still happening today. I'm not against that. I'm all for that. But you've got to understand, in that 40 days, Jesus spoke to them about the kingdom. He demonstrated the kingdom earlier by casting out devils. He said, if they're, not, if they're cast out by the finger of God, he said, you know that the kingdom is already here. Yes, but in this 40-day period, he did no miracle. All he did was teach. All he took was leaders aside 
and he taught them. Now listen to what it says. Speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, uh, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost in many days hence. So then we all know the story of Acts 2, what went on in Acts 2. They gathered together, the Father outpoured the Holy Ghost, just not on those 120, but on everyone. Peter had already stood up and declared that this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel in the last days. Now I grew up in the in the church, and then I got, and then when I first we first started into Pentecost, they're always waiting for this fulfillment of Joel sometime in the last days. When in all reality, it is past tense to us already. The last days were the last days of Judaism. It was the last days of the law. It was the last days of all of that. And he poured out his spirit on all flesh. Not just that 120 in the upper room. The 120 in the upper room were the only ones that received it. Remember, 500 heard the command, go up. But 380 went home. But the 120 were in the upper room and they all received. And he, through the Holy Ghost, began to work through them to get done the further work that the Father had given them to do. Okay? Now we got all of that started. Now we all know the story. That and, and, I, and I covered some of it already last week and, and Thursday evening. And we find that by the time they got through the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and, and being baptized in water and 3,000 saved, and then you got 5,000 that got saved. And this picture that I find here in Acts 4 is a picture that I feel is where we're at at this present time. If they needed, after they had done a miracle, after they had ministered and got 5,000 believers, if they needed to be in a place praying to receive more power to get further work done, then we need to come to a realization that whatever we've done, whatever we've accomplished, whatever God has worked through us, there has to come a gr greater gathering, a greater anointing to bring a greater power upon us so that we can get more done than what they did. He's already promised us the times of refreshing in chapter 3, verse 19, 20, and 21. He said he would send Jesus whom the heavens must receive until the restoration of all things. Well, when's all things going to get restored? You want to put it off to the future or do you want to begin to realize that that's not how God's going to do it? He's already doing the restoration process right now. God's plan is to restore all things. And how he's going to do it is through a people. He's going to do it through you and others like you who have an open heart, an open mind, an open willingness to allow God to fill them and work through them. In the process of that working, there's a cleansing. What was it? I, I, I couldn't catch all the words that, that Travis was singing. But in this, we, we sang the song about fire and oil and and, and, and water and all of that, those all speak of the work of the Holy Ghost and all the work of the Holy Ghost is always cleansing the vessel in which he's using. Not only does he empower the vessel, but he cleanses the vessel. You, 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 the picture was in, 
if you go to the, the first time that Jesus had a miracle was the wedding at Cana. All right? And they took those pots and, and they put the wine in the pots. But those were uh, washing pots for the day of Pentecost. Those pots. They held 27 gallons. Those pots. And, and they would fill those pots on the day of Pentecost and they would wash to their armpits in those pots. Now Jesus took those pots and he put, he put the water in the pot showing the cleansing and then he spoke into it and turned it into wine which showed the joy and the fulfillment. But if you'd have left that wine in there, excuse me, if you'd have left that wine in there and you didn't pour it out, it began to settle and dregs had began to get down to the bottom of those pots and they began to be dirty with the dregs of the wine, the settling of the wine. So the pouring out is what God wants in every one of our lives as he dumps us out, as he pours us out, is so that there's no settling of that, of that aspect. That's what God wants to do. Say, God loves, God loves. To, kick to kick over your water bucket. He loves to kick over your water bucket. He, if, 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 you, if, if you're all joy and wine, listen, don't, don't look at me like I don't know what's going on. I went to, I went to Toronto. I, I know the Toronto movement. We had it in our church, and we didn't know what was going on. It was just happening. But you can't have that all the time. You can't have just that all the time. Sooner or later, God's got to kick the bucket over. God's got to get it poured out. And so here we find in this story of the first three, three four chapters of the book of Acts, these three, these three guys, they go and they heal this guy. He's about a little over 40 years old. He'd been sitting there at the gate. I always said this. I wondered how many times Jesus walked by him on his way into prayer. Never, ever gave him a moment. See, we don't think that far. I, you know, I just think of these things all the time. And when I begin to ask questions, then you begin to get answers. You want to know why? Jesus did healing. But he wanted to heal him through Peter, James, and John. And so when they when that happened, they the first thing they were the chief priests, guess who came after him? The chief priests, the leaders, and the Sadducees. They were sad, you see. They didn't believe in spirit. They didn't believe in resurrection life, so they couldn't believe in healing, and they couldn't believe in, 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 in deliverance. They couldn't believe in any of that. They couldn't believe the fact that these guys were preaching about a Jesus who was resurrected from the dead because they were sad, you see. They didn't believe in that. There's a lot of churches that don't believe that we can walk in the power of God. That's sad, you see. There are people who don't believe that you can talk in tongues and prophesy and, and do all that. That's sad, you see. They don't know what it is to walk in the Spirit. They can get intellect. They can, they can study. They're, they're, there's marvelous, smart men. 90% of what we have in study guides that we, we use today that were taken off the King James Bible that were done in the late 1800s were by people that did not know or experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's sad, you see. And we hold to a lot of their doctrines and we hold to a lot of their teachings because the real outpouring of this latter day really didn't start till around 1900. We give it credit to it to 1906, Azusa Street, but it was a little bit before that. There was a guy by the name of Charles Parham in Kansas City, and it poured out there. 
There were individuals before that that had it, but for it to come generally as we know it worldwide, it really started right after Azusa Street and Charles Parham. Because Azusa Street would have never happened if it wouldn't have been for Charles Parham. Charles Parham moved from Kansas City to Texas. And while he was down in Texas, because they, they kicked him out of Kansas City, because in his school, they were all talking in tongues and prophesying. And so he went to Texas. And all of a sudden I had constipation. I forgot uh, the black fellow's name who started yes. Seymour. That's William Seymour. William Seymour was a black man and he couldn't, because of the racial issues, he couldn't go into Charles Parham's class. But Charles Parham allowed him to sit in the hallway by the door so he could listen to the teaching that Charles Parham was teaching down in Texas. And all of a sudden, they're all getting a baptism of the Holy Ghost, and William Seymour, who happened to be a Nazarene, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he decided to go out to California. Now you all know the historical fact. So here we are. It's sad, you see, that more people couldn't... We, 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 we were so racial, we were so whatever... But God was trying to bring us to a new dimension in Him. He's been trying to open the door for us to see things that we haven't seen. But we haven't always been willing to stay open, stay hungry, stay desirous. Because when we get to Acts 4, after these after these men were, were, had been brought in and, and, and been th threatened with their lives and the, and the losing of their jobs and the losing of their families and the lose. See, we, we, we just don't know what threatening is. I just, I just watched something um, the other day on, on the news, and I can't tell you where I watched it, but, but about a guy who was the lead, um, he, was, he was the lead news guy in one major market. And because he gave the true explanation of what's going on between Israel and, and Palestine and gave the whole story See, what, what we don't even realize is the fact that Israel made a deal when, when they were given the land back in 1947 by the United Nations, they were given all them oil fields down there in along in what is part of Egypt. And they agreed to give it back if they would just, if all the rest of them nations would let them live in peace. You didn't know that, did you? And he was explaining all of this. And the next day, the manager of the station told him, come in, called him in and said, either quit or get fired. <clears throat> now, see, we don't really, beloved, think that'll ever happen to us in America. Not, not America. It's already happening, honey. It's all, that kind of stuff is already happening. These guys were called in. Were they, what were they going to do? Take their fishing boats? They'd already give them up. What were they going to do? Take their nets? They had already left for Jesus. But they had threatened them with their lives. And we need to come to a realization, beloved, that we just are not going to just uh, tiptoe through, through the tulips like we've been doing in our lifestyle and thinking that nothing is ever, ever, ever going to face us, but God is just going to take us through. Everything's just going to be fine, you know. I'm going to get my degree, and I'm going to get my this, and I'm going to get my that, and I'm going to get my everything. Everything's just going to be great. My kids are going to grow up well, and I'm going to see all my grandchildren and all that stuff. You have no clue, beloved, lest God, Bless God. 
Bless God. Here we got these guys. They were threatened with their lives. The only reason they didn't get stoned or get, get, get they, they wouldn't have got crucified because the Jews didn't crucify, the Jews stoned. The reason they didn't get stoned because 5,000 plus more people every day were beginning to believe in this Jesus guy. And so when they returned onto their own, I got to I got to finish up here. When they returned onto their own, their own were rejoicing. Oh, thank God you're alive! Woo, baby, you're back to church. But then they began to realize they better do some praying. And they better do some seeking. And they better do some hungering. And begin to ask God seriously, Lord, you're going to have to keep us. You're going to have to empower us. Because we cannot carry this word without your doing in our lives. We cannot continue to, to do what we think we can do in God without you giving us another measure of your spirit. And so they came and gathered onto their own, and they began to pray. They began to pray, God, strengthen us. God, we need more of you. We need more of the Holy Ghost. We need a greater manifestation. We need a greater hunger. We need a greater desire. We need a greater dimension of you. God, you can only do it. I can't, I can't crank up enough energy to get this done. I can't go to some Bible school and get myself all educated and that'll do it. What I need is the Holy Ghost. What I need is another outpouring. Now the scripture says it shut the building that they were in. But what God needs to do is shake some of the stuff we built. When I began to think about fire, it says in, in Hebrews 12, he said, he's going to come and shake everything that will be shaken. Our God is a consuming fire, the verse says. What's he going to do? He's going to consume the wood to hate the stubble. He's going to purify all the precious things. He said not only is he going to shake the earth like he did before. Mount Sinai, remember he shook the earth and a few other places. But he said he's going to shake heaven and earth. Now, some of us think, oh, yeah, well, that's just to get rid of all that. That's already taken care of, honey. The heaven he's going to shake is the way you think. Oh, well, I got this thing all planned out. Good. When God gets done shaking it, we'll see what's left. All I know was one thing. He's going to have a kingdom. And what's a kingdom without a kingdom people? I'm going to say that again. What's a kingdom without kingdom people? All that stuff in the Old Testament are on types and shadows. This is the real deal. God wants a people who can walk in power, who can walk in the fullness of His reality. Who can walk in him. Amen. 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 I got one thing to do. Before we leave. I want every one of us. On our feet. And gathering together. Holding hands. Come on. Step across the aisle. Hold hands. Are you all here? Yes, sir. Have you all heard what I said? Yes, sir. There's only one thing we need here. 
We need an Acts 4 experience. We need God to shake the house. We need God to shake us. Fill us more with his presence. So that when we open our mouth, we open our mouth with power. So that the word of the Lord comes out of our mouth. The first work of the Holy Ghost when it comes out of your mouth is to convict. That's the first work. Go back and read Acts, or, uh, John 14. When the word of the Lord comes out of your mouth, it will bring conviction. Peter stood up to speak and it pricked their hearts. That's the power of God. Secondly, they were bold. That was one thing they prayed for was boldness. Make us bold, God. Make us bold. Make us in a place where we're not afraid to lose a job. We're not afraid to lose our house. We're not afraid to lose anything. Our bankroll, whatever it is, we're not afraid. We are bold to speak the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Are you ready? Now, Father, in the heavenly name of Jesus and the powerful name of Jesus, we cry out, Father, for not only for ourselves, Lord, but we cry out for this people. Not only this people, God, but we cry out for your people, God, worldwide, Father, that the power of God in the Holy Ghost will begin to shake them free, God, from all the stuff that holds them back, God, from being bold in you and being confident in you and strong in you in the fullness of you, Lord, that the word of the Lord that is in their mouth, God, might go forth with life-giving reality. Father, I pray for this house. I pray for those that are not here today that are, that are often enjoying themselves. Father, I ask you to shake them where they're at, oh God. Begin to bring across their thought life, God, a new way of thinking. Let the power of the Holy Ghost rest upon them, Father. Rest upon this people, God. Shake us, God. Shake us, God. Shake us, God, into new dimensions of you, we pray. Remove from us, God, absolutely everything, Lord, that is not of you, we pray. Everything. That we might be bold to stand in your presence. Face to face with you, Lord. Declaring that you are God Almighty and there's none else. Father, I praise you, Jesus. I thank you for the day. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. In the powerful name of Jesus, let the days ahead, Father, be days like we've never seen before, God, of the release of the power of God in the lives of our people, we pray. In Jesus' name. 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 And everyone said. Amen. Said what? Amen. Said what? Amen. Amen, God. Amen. Praise God. Love on.